trust me. I mean, I would want you to like dig deep into some of the things, but I hate talking to people prior to, you know that. I don't know if you've yeah. seen what you've seen of Get Marked Up. But, oh, oh, shit, this is the wrong hat. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you, had to do a, you had to do a casting had a, costume oh, change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I'd be like, hey, good morning. My name is Mark M. Spelko. Welcome to Get Marked Up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't even know what episode this is, so it's going to be in the description. And uh, today, I am so grateful and thankful to be able to know this, this sweetheart of a man, uh, and that is Tony Wiley. Now, Tony, <clears throat> we've met once in person. Yeah, that we was went it. To, I was in your home state of Cali, and you came out, and we had uh, dinner that evening. That was pretty good to finally get to connect in person, man. Absolutely. So, and since then, it sounds like you've been up to a whole bunch of different stuff. I stick my hand into a bunch of things, and I put my foot into a lot of doors. I guess that's a good way to describe it. <laughs> the, the, which is fine. I, was, I mean, yeah. you probably get, you know, some fingers crushed every now and then, but oh yeah, you're a, you're a big boy. You can handle it. Um, I want to know some of the things that I don't know. I, I really love some of the things that you talk about in your book, Side Hustle Millionaire, but you don't dig deep into some of the personal things. Mm -hmm. I would love to know a little bit more about how you grew up because you said that you didn't have such a great relationship with your dad. Right. But now you do. And I would love to know what happened back when you were younger that you made you think that you didn't deserve a good relationship with your father. And then what happened when you became an adult and started to cultivate something um, extraordinary with your dad? I think it was more on his end. Uh, there was nothing like no pivotal moment or any kind of issue that, that created, like, I guess, a resentment or anything. But my dad was a Vietnam veteran, so combat veteran. And you have to realize that the generation of coming back from that war, there was a lot of you know, hate and anger towards the soldiers at that time with all the different movements going on. And even the soldiers themselves always felt like, why are we over here and things like that. So it was the only war that I can think of in our history where the soldiers came home and people were booing them and like making them feel like worse. So there's no doubt that there's a lot of Vietnam vets out there that kind of feel that way. And, you know, he, he had a rougher childhood. They moved a lot when he was a kid. And he, I think he went to something like 10 different schools, like in his childhood so he got really tired of having to meet new people and losing friends, losing girlfriends, leaving things behind. And, and when he got married with my mom, she's a Japanese immigrant, he just said, you know, I don't want to do that. So he made a, a conscious change that his parents didn't have. We're going to plant our roots into one city and we're never going to move and I'll just find jobs around here. So that's what we did. So I grew up in Friendswood, Texas. It's a suburb of Houston, about you know, 35, 40 miles outside of Houston. And we stayed there kindergarten through graduation and, and they're still live there. My parents still live there. I've moved on to different areas of Houston, but they, they are still there. And the thing is that him, my dad and I are very much alike and we, we have a stubborn tendency, but he's also been a gunnery sergeant in the U S Marines, which barked orders at everybody. And he had that tendency to bring that home. If he had a bad day working in the chemical refineries, which was, that's a, that's a tough job. It's a labor job. I did it for three years after high school. And you go work in the Houston summers and, and the hot heat and just the chemical smells and dealing with a bunch of, you know, really a lot of people that aren't really effective at doing what they do. And you're having to babysit grown ass men is what it comes down to. I saw that in the oil industry as well. Kind of the same thing. Right. But I think he had a bad, he had, had a bad temper and he was a road rager type and he would just get angry like really quickly. And I just, I, I took those mental notes cause I was thinking, you know, is this how I have to be to be a man? Is this like what I have to look forward to mm. yelling at people and <laughs> how much I hate my job and, and this sucks. And then stressing out over money. And a lot of these things you watch as a child, you start to wait, start say to that wonder, you said your dad stressed out over money. Yeah. Cause they were, they're blue collar. My dad worked as, originally as a pipe fitter. Then he, kind of worked his way up the ranks later on in, in, in my, I guess my high school years, he was making enough comfortable income. I don't think he was making six figures at that time, but my mom was also working in the public schools as a cafeteria worker. So not a lot of income coming in the house. So they were always just really tight on things. I mean, we had good Christmases. We had gifts at birthdays, but there was no allowance or anything like that in the Watley household. It was like, go do your work, go figure something out. 
go, go teach yourself how to make money. And then, you know, they supported that. They always have. So they always taught me the values of hard work and just getting out there and doing what it takes to make it. And that, that's something I still carry today. I'm, I'm grateful to have that drive. Yes, you do. Because that's <laughs> who I am. But it's, it all came because it wasn't easy for me to have the things I wanted. And I could never be the excuse maker and, and just you know, bellyache and c- complain or cry because I wasn't getting something because I was just getting the, the shit knocked out of me or spanked. So I learned like, hmm, I just got to go figure this out. And you know that I don't regret that. But I think my dad and I were really more butting heads probably late junior high and through high school. It's just because I didn't, I don't, I still don't like being told what to do. I don't, I like advice. Who does, I, Tony? And I, and I have a real, I guess, I don't know. I, I, I kind of go, I may, maybe I take that a little harder when someone bosses me around. I hate that. Do you like feel some that? People, like some people some of, tolerate it. I hate it. Okay. So. So what about it? Why do you hate being told what to do? I think it's because of a combination of me having to figure out things on myself. And I did so. And I, I felt like I was always trying to prove something or get some validation and you just weren't getting that. Hmm. So did that come in from like an, an anger or something that you had to go through that you just hated? Or is it just because you just don't like being told what to do? Ah, oh, man, I think that we had a comfortable life growing up, my sister and I, we, we were never starving. I mean, we definitely had the, the government cheese and things like that, but we were never starving. I didn't even realize what we were considered, you know, lower middle class until later on in life. Like I didn't realize like the different socioeconomic platforms and statuses and all that. I, I knew that there was rich people and there was normal people. I, that's only the two classes I could remember. Sure. But then we find out there's actually levels within each of those as well. Right. You don't, you're just not aware of that until you get out in the real world. I mean, to give you guys an idea, my mom made our clothes from, from basically birth through like junior high. She made our clothes. And we just thought it was like, oh, that's cool. My mom can sew. Like, that's cool. She liked to do it. Mm-hmm. But it was because we couldn't afford to go buy the brand label clothes. So she just made our clothes. Like, I remember going to the, the pattern store and picking out patterns and buying the, the shirt, the material. And, you know, what do you want to wear? I was like, oh, I'll wear that one and then that one. And she'd just buy yards of that and, and take it home. And make it. So my mom made our clothes. And, and she I, turned it into more of like a game? Yeah. Yeah, it was like creative and she's very artistic and likes to paint and, uh, and a lot of the things I have, I get from my mom. So I'm very creative and like to draw and paint and do things, arts and crafts and build cars and yeah. build websites. So I've always found creative outlets and that's who I, even the content that I create on social media or standing on a stage or writing a speech, those are all creative things. I'm very creative. So although I have an engineering degree, I would say that I'm less analytical, even though I can operate pretty well in that capacity. I'm more creative. Yeah. The, the whole reason to get the engineering degree was to go get a six figure salary. That was the in, only intent because I knew that being a teacher or an artist really pretty hard, you know, you're going through that, you know, you're being an artist yourself. It's tough. Yes, it is. I was looking for more of a tough a or not to though. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, here I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing my passion. Like this is my passion. Exactly. And I, and I made a full circle and I'm teaching. Like I've always been a teacher, even as a child, I, I like to learn things, yeah. apply them, yep. get results. And then I'm like, yes. Yeah, let me show you. <laughs> I'm going to teach more people this, how to do it. And, and I've been that. I've been that like my entire life. So the engineering degree and all that was, was really a distraction. Mm. You know, I was always finding ways to be creative and to mentor people within that career path. But that was never my, it was never my job description. I just did it. I've always been that mentor. I've always given people advice. I've always encouraged people. So I found ways to be creative within that, even though it wasn't my duty. But you figured out how to monetize it, even though it wasn't your duty. That's right. And I want to get to that in a little bit, but I want to figure out what are the things that you did, you and your dad did today, these days that cultivated a good um, relationship? What are the things that he's opened up to you about that has that he said, you know, if he had a bad temper, how did he fix that? What were the th- actionable steps that he did to achieve a great relationship with the son? I don't know if he's ever fixed it. I think he just kind of mellowed out with age. I think he was probably just more angry. And as his job became higher paid, he became a little less angry about things. And I think, I think when you're financially struggling and 
you're just going through a lot of different things. I mean, there's no telling what was going on back then. I mean, he could have PTSD and all kinds of things from the war and we just don't know, but you know, but he's mellowed out with age. Definitely. I mean, he's, he's 70 now and he's, he's very chill and relaxed and a good grandfather. And, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's each decade of our lives. We always change even every year we always change, but I noticed he's definitely become more compassionate and like more, open and more friendly as he's aged. So I think it was just a time thing for him. And you feel that, you know, trying to find, say, for example, if some people are struggling at, at, at creating a relationship with their either significant other or um, their, their mother or their father or their, you know, their best friend or, or somebody that um, you feel the best way to handle it is by telling them how you feel or, do you think that the best way to handle it is by listening as to how they feel? I think the communication is the breakdown for most relationship issues. It's always communication. So you have to be able to communicate how you feel and why you think the way you do. And you also have to build a strong enough relationship where you can do that in a safe place where people aren't going to react. And it's all about how you say things rather than what you say. I mean, it's, Every message we have can be said in an antagonistic way or a supportive, constructive way. Yeah. So you have to just gain that awareness. And when you can start to step back from your emotions and that emotional state, because we can feel anger or fear or anxiety. We could feel those. That's normal. We feel emotions as humans, but you have to have that level of awareness to take a step back and go, okay, I'm, I'm feeling angry right now. Why do I feel angry? What is my reaction going to be? How do I want to react to this? Do I want to show anger? Maybe in some cases that's required, you know, if some, something's threatening you or something, or maybe that's the reaction, but you have to put things into context and it takes that split second of awareness to step back from the big picture and go, what would the better version of Tony do in this moment? What would the asshole Tony do in this moment? And most people just go straight to knee jerk reactions. Like it thought out the mouth. And that's how most of us are when we're younger. I, I, been in that situation many times. I think when I was younger, as I've gotten older, I've become more aware. And as, as weird as it sounds, Mark, I gain more awareness, it seems like every year, I feel like I'm stepping further back. And, and you, you can relate to this. And some of the people watching this or hearing this is think of yourself as an actor, the lead role in your own movie, your life is the movie. You're the lead role of your movie. You've got a director, which may be God or who any or some other being or entity or just something out there that's kind of directing you to become the better version of yourself might be your mentor. It could be the people that you admire. Just they're guiding you, right? You're the lead actor. Something happens. You feel that you feel the emotion. You put that out on screen. What would that actor do? Like if you're trying to play a role, you go, okay, this is the role that I got to play for this. If I'm a evil villain, I got to be the evil villain guy and just get into that. Or if you're the, you know, the, the protagonist and you're the hero, like you have to react a little different based on your casting role. So that's how your life should be. Do I want to be the protagonist or do I want to be the antagonist? And, and you really just look at your reactions and how you show these emotions. And does this really exemplify the best version of what you want to be? And the director, if you did it wrong, the director would be like, cut, you know, you didn't do it right, Mark. You like, like you gotta be like this, like you add more of this, add more, you know, positivity or humility or humor into this. Right. And, the antagonist would be like, you need to be meaner and go harder and yell at them. Or so your awareness is just like thinking about that. And the easiest way I think about it is like, if you live your life, like you're on camera, which is not too far from the truth nowadays, that's true. <laughs> if you live Like you're on camera 24 seven, which reality we are, cause we've got these stupid cell phone things that with multiple cameras embedded in them. And they're always around and they're in your back pocket. So you do live with a camera and other people around you are living with their cameras too, that can turn them on onto you. We're on camera right now, zoom, we have security cam. There's always cameras everywhere. Right? So when you start to think of it that way, some people may feel kind of scared about that. Oh my gosh, there's all these cameras watching me, but to somebody that's mentally strong, they take this as an opportunity. I'm going to behave like I'm always on camera because that one time I slip up, I might actually be on camera and I don't want that to be captured. So that's right. what this is going to do is make you take better avenues and take, make better decisions along your journey. Like when I'm feeling lazy and I don't want to go outside and work out, I go, okay, what would the camera 
what would the audience think right now if I like if they could hear my thoughts like man I'm just being a bitch like get your ass up and go out there and like exercise like quit making excuses right so then you go out there and you do it and you never regret doing the right thing I mean you just don't you just don't like I've never left the gym going man I wish I didn't come to the gym I don't think you anybody know? has I mean, unless no, they break no, something yeah. physically or they, you know, get, you know, hit on and then, you know, things go south. Injured. Yeah. If you get injured, yeah. but even if you got injured, cause we've all been injured working out, you yeah. still don't go, man, I wish I wouldn't have come to the gym today. You just wish I wouldn't have done that exercise wrong maybe or, you know, <laughs> so, so live, that's a good tip. Just, just live like you're on camera and be comfortable with that and use that thought to your advantage rather than try to hide from things because your true character is built when, you're observed doing the things that when, when no one's looking, watching. that's right. Yeah, when nobody's watching is who you truly are. That's exactly right. I want to get to uh, talk about a couple of your mentors and how you discovered them and uh, why you believe it's so important to have a coach or coaches or mentors. Well, I would say that early on in my, my career and entrepreneurship for the last 20 years, my mentors were just really in the form of books because I started my first online business in 1998, which was right at the verge of internet. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't like motivational speakers or YouTube or Facebook, nothing like that. It was basically the internet was just a way to communicate across channels. I just read a lot of business books. I like to read books and I said, okay, I don't have the lifestyle that I want. So how do I learn this? Well, there's these books in the bookstore from successful people that most people would recognize. And I was reading all that stuff. I was reading Donald Trump books before he even thought about being president. You know, I've, I've probably got one back there that's like 15 years old. Was the art and of the deal? Yeah, that was one of them. I think I have one of the original ones there. It's old. It's old looking book. And his it, book. The 80s, wonderful year for that book. Wonderful year. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. I think he's got some more cliche phrases now than he did back then. He was more <laughs> business. He was more of kind of a, he was more kind of a direct back then. He's softened up with age as well. You know, sure. which is kind of surprising with all the attacks he's been, you know, getting, you know, but he's, he's kind of softened up, to be honest. He was actually a more, a more direct, like a harder core version of himself. Oh, sure. Him. Sure. I mean, you, you don't get 9 billion by being soft. No. So, and, and the thing is, is that, so I read books. Here's a weird thing about books, Mark. This, is, this also goes back to my parents. I remember, I hope this relates to somebody that sees this. I remember going to the bookstore when I was little and seeing the self-help section is what they called it. The little shelf with the book, self-help at the top. And I remember asking my parents, you know, what's over there? And I remember, I still remember, because I probably asked more than once just out of curiosity. And I remember my dad saying, well, that's, you don't need that. That's what weak people need. Like people that are, you know, people that need help need that. They need that self-help stuff. And I wish he wouldn't have told me that because I held on to that probably most of my twenties thinking like, I'm strong. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't need that. I could figure it out on my own because that's what our subconscious is programmed with that. That's for weak people. And even some people even say that about church. Oh, you know, you, you know, we don't need church. We're, we're pretty strong. We're, we're religious, but we don't need to go to that thing every Sunday because that's what weak people do. They, they need that. Like, we don't need that. We, I've heard that before from yeah. various family members. So it's, it's these subconscious programmings that you receive when you're a child and you never question, and, but you don't want to be perceived as weak. So you just hold on to these things. You never challenge them. And then you go into adulthood and you start to surround yourself with people who have achieved more and they keep telling you, like, you got to do personal development. You got to get a coach. You've got to invest in yourself. You got to get skills. And you're like, well, that's the self help section. That's for weak people. And this paradox starts yep. to occur where yes. the people that have everything I want keep telling me one thing. And the people that I grew up with are telling me another thing. And you go, well, what, where do I want to end up? Like, well, I want to end up over here. So I need to go maybe start taking some advice and sticking your, your, your pinky toe in the pool to, of personal development to see what it feels like. And then soon enough, you realize like this shit works. Mm -hmm. like, like it really works. Like the mindset, mindset is everything. And, and you hear that your whole life and you're like, what does that even mean? Mindset is everything. It, it is, you know this, Mark. Mindset is everything. 100%. But until you know what that means by by way of taking the actions and exploring. You mean, you mean actually it, living it? Seeing the results? Yep. You will never understand that phrase. That's right. It's just a cliche. It's kind of like another bullshit 
phrase of like time is money Notice well so that. for the pe- time is not money it's that's exactly right i was talking to a friend of mine the other night i'm like no that's not true but i didn't want to say not even related not, not even related. close time is not money they're not the fucking same See, so you got to challenge these cliches that you grew up with and, right. and understand where they came from. And so that's what I led to eventually watching more videos. And then I, you know, led to reading more books and then podcasts and, and just be a consumer of those things and taking notes. Always pretty, pretty good at applying things I learned to myself. I never really had to be handheld and go, well, this is what you do next. And I get some people need that. I, I just, I guess. You were a hands-on kind of guy. Yeah, project management. I think my corporate career project management taught me how to do the building blocks and the steps and the schedules. And so I can see things like in a very fragmented thing and how they all fit together and how this impacts this. And well, you got, you got good at one thing though. Like you got really good at one particular subject. Yeah. Which was engineering. And then within that structure, you got even better within one thing within engineering. And then you branched out after you mastered that one thing. Exactly. I think, the project management side of my engineering is it was invaluable for everything I'm doing because I was managing 200 to $500 million international projects, burning up 1.5 million a day in some of the phases of that project. A lot of moving parts, 75 to hundred people reporting on that project. And I got very comfortable at very complex things and how everything has a cause and effect and the dollar rates and risks and all these dangerous things. And, dealing with international stuff alone is like all the red tape and the politics behind that. And so I've got all this 25 years of that crammed in my head, which is highly complex running, you know, big projects and multi-billion dollar industries. And now I go do small businesses and it's like fucking easy. Yeah. Like small business is really easy to me. And anyone that is out there coaching, like this is really hard, you know, small business is really hard and you need a coach to, it's like, no, you just, you've never done a real business. That's why you keep saying that go, go manage, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then you'll find out it's really easy to do small business until it becomes hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Sure. So I don't tell people it's hard. I just give them guidance to help them along the way. I don't like, I don't try to belittle people. I don't try to insult their intelligence or act like I have all the secret sauce and you know, you're never going to know unless you hire me. I don't do that. I just, well, because that's not true. First of all, and then you don't want to spew some lies. I could give you the best information and everything I know, and I already know that only 1% of the people that hear it is going to go do something. So, yeah. so the people that want to work with me, they come find me and they hire me. And then we go hand to hand and we go like, here's what we're doing next. Go execute. Boom. Results. Go execute. Results. Go execute. Results. And then after a year of doing this, they look back and I'm like, holy crap, we've done all this stuff. We're making all this money. It's like, yes, that's how it works. So now they can graduate from that mindset and that process and go do whatever they want and like scale all kinds of stuff. So I think that me trying to solve everything because I didn't have money and had plenty of time. So I was just basically trading my time to figure things out. And as I started to earn more money, I realized like these are really simple problems. I could just go hire someone else that is an expert at either teaching me or solving the problem. So I can just move on to the next challenge because I think a lot of times people spend way too much time trying to solve simple things that maybe they're not good at, And the whole objective of entrepreneurship and building something is to get to the end end game, you know, like what's the goal here? So if it's a real simple challenge, like why are you wasting all this time? Like, why are you going to waste a month learning something that you can go pay somebody that can do it in like an hour? Yeah. Like just, just pay them. And then you can get the next bigger problem and then like work towards those. So a lot of people will have this reluctancy to spend money because they, they have a death grip with white knuckles on things that they own and they don't realize they don't realize it's an investment. You That's know? right. Hiring a coach is not an expense; it's an investment. That's it's right. It's no different than you going to to college to get a degree, like or me taking have, acting classes. Anything. It's an yeah. investment. Yeah. You know, but there's so many people that I would say that everyone in this country sees the value and go, okay, I can see paying for education and school at a university to get a degree. They can see. They may not agree with it, but they can see the the value. Sure. But now if you, if you tell, I would say 80% of the entrepreneurs or people that own businesses that have never had a coach, like, Hey, you should invest in a coach and like get you, they're going to be like, Oh no, you know, that's expensive. Yeah. It's more expensive not to trust me. (laughs) Exactly. So it's like, okay, that's why you're still in the exact same revenue for the last 10 years that I've known you. 
and everything I built and everything my clients are building are just blowing past you. And it's like, it's like, because I had to go learn, I had to go spend that money to invest. So nowadays I just look for who's got the answer. Like that's one of the best phrases I'll share with the listeners, man. It's average people when they, when they're presented with a challenge, they always say, how can I solve that? Successful people presented with a challenge ask, who do I know that can solve that first? It's always who, not how. That's a great point. Huh, I never thought of it that way. So that must mean I'm average. Maybe, maybe your awareness just stepped up a little, see? Oh yeah, dude, I level, here's the thing though, you know, once I started learning how to commit to me and actually doing the things that I said I was going to do, Mm -hmm. it, that changed. Like I started attracting what I wanted into my life, like six months ago. It's like, I want a partner who is there for me, who I can be there for them, who we can bounce ideas off of each other, who we will promote and all this other stuff. And that's starting to happen. I told myself a while ago, like, oh, I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to have a couple albums done at uh, this year, September 7th, December 30th. Cool. And now I have one more project. I'm dropping three albums this year. It's like I, because I said that I was going to, and now it's happening. And I have people reaching out to me like, how can I share my story? How can I become involved with what you're doing? And I'm because I'm sharing what I'm up to. That's it. Just, just like you, simple. you're sharing. It's so fucking simple. simple. But here's the thing. There are some people who don't want to share certain parts of their story. Say, for example, I still have a, a secret. I have one secret that some people know that I will never share with the public ever because that's for me that is for me personally you know you can have a personal life you can have something along those lines but there are certain things that if you open up and talk about it in public with on like on camera like for you for example like you had to first you might have been embarrassed about something in your past that you had to learn how to deal with and now it's cool because you had to discuss it because you oh, got on speaking. that camera and you talked and you've been speaking about it. Exactly. Because you yeah, talked about speaking. it. That, that's me. Public speaking. That was like the scariest thing ever. And now I get paid to do it. So it's, <laughs> you'll, you'll find that the greatest fears you have will uncover talents and skills that you didn't know you have. And you level up because you do. Absolutely. That's the only way you level up. That's exactly right. So speaking oh, of which leveling up Andy Frisella and Ed Milet are the two main mentors of yours. Yeah. Okay, I want to hear about some of the things that you guys have discussed and do, I mean, what are the things that they have taught you that you wish that somebody would be like, you need to sign up with these guys because they're teaching you these things. This is why I signed up with them. This is why you need a coach. I came across Andy Frazella maybe probably eight, eight, nine years ago before he was doing what he's doing. He was active on a automotive forum. And just like any other automotive form with fancy cars, like the ones I belong to, like the ones I've built, he's just another business dude that had nice cars. So I remember the name and just kind of followed him and said, oh, that's cool. He's a successful guy. Nice Ford GT is what he was driving around. And, and um, cool car, man. So cool. So I kind of remember that. And I remember him talking about on his social media how <laughs> he was going to do a podcast. And I was like, cool. So I thought it was going to be more about lifestyle and cars because that's what he's always shown. He never really, you know, put his voice out there. And when he started talking about entrepreneurship with MF CEO project, yeah, yeah, I said, "Dude, this guy's just like me. Like he likes cars and entrepreneurship, and those are the only two things I really, really have a lot of passion for. Like I'm a fitness guy, but I don't like talking about fitness for more than 15 minutes. If someone <laughs> starts talking about fitness routines and diets. I'm like, like, I don't even want to like, blah, like, like I go do it, but I don't like to have the energy around talking about it. Sure. And for me, business is a game and, and I love cars. So, so cool. He's got this podcast. He's going to talk about business and maybe he'll talk about cars. He never talked about cars ever really. So I was like, okay, cool. And then around that time, the very first paid group I joined was Lewis Howe's paid group. And I liked Lewis's business model. I'd listened to his podcast for about six months before joining his inner circle because it didn't exist. He, he basically launched it when he has podcasts. I was like, mm-hmm. cool, I'll go join that for 50 bucks a month and learn some stuff for him. And I liked it because he had a business model that I like. 
I like that he's got the podcast, he writes books, he's got the paid groups, he can do it anywhere in the world. I mean, it, the non-negotiables that he had were very similar to mine. From, <laughs> I don't want, I don't that, want to. Right, by the way, right there, non-negotiables, very powerful. Yes. Go, continue. Yeah. yeah, I don't like having to be anywhere and I like location. I don't like being forced to work somewhere, like mm. showing up anymore because I did that my whole life. Mm. And I like being able to travel and work anywhere in the world. And I just like helping people rather than just trying to build some company to make money. You know, it's just, it just mm. never felt right to me. So well, it never works just to build you know, a company that just makes money is, you know, where's the why that's, that's oil. That's oil companies. That's all we're doing. So, yeah. yeah. And there's no loyalty so there. I model him. <laughs> I modeled a lot of the social media behavior around his business model. Mm. And that's what he teaches is how to, kind of build your social media presence and branding. He'd bring his experts and they'd teach us something new every month. And it's like, cool. I, I, I knew a lot about marketing and businesses from 20 years of business, but I didn't know the social media side of it as well. And so a lot of the things I do, I learned from him, but in your own flavor, obviously. We sure. all have our own style. So I went to uh, 10X Growth Con in Vegas in 2018. This Because at that time I was just learning to become a public speaker and that's kind of like, that was the super, it's not anymore, but it was like the Super Bowl of public speakers. So Andy Frazella and Lewis were both speaking at that event. I was like, cool, I'll go to this event and see both of them. And then Ed Milet was also there, but I wasn't that, there. Dude, he that. crushed that. He crushed he was, that. He was the best speaker of the event. He was the best I, speaker there. The best speaker, the emotional yep. and the power and the authority and like, mm -hmm. like, holy crap. And I was like, dude, I want to learn to speak from that guy. I made a mental note. I was like, I want to learn from that guy to be a speaker. And honestly, this, the other surprise speaker, there was Tim Grover. I didn't expect him to be so bad. So that was a, that, honestly, that event was the best speaking event I've ever been to. And it's been years since. So yeah, yeah. understanding just that the power out and Bradley was on the stage. Well, so it's funny how like all those people that run that stage I'm connected to now. Yeah. Because I was just in the nosebleed section watching them three years ago. Right. Yeah. That was and, a cool event, man. That was a lot of fun. So I said, okay, I'd like to learn business and stuff from Andy from the podcast and then like to learn the speaking side from Ed. And then Arate Syndicate was announced probably six months later. And they were the two guys that were leading that. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like the two guys, I want, it was almost like I visualized it and it worked out. I was like, I got to join this. So mm -hmm. I applied and it's all application process. And so I applied and, you know, they've got all these questions about character and what you're doing and all this stuff. And I got accepted to the syndicate the first year, which was at that time, $60,000. And I said, man, I don't even know what they're, they haven't given us what they're going to do. It's like, it was kind of like you had to jump off a cliff and hope that it all works out because you just sure. didn't know. And at the time I was still starting up my 365 driven brand and I wasn't even monetizing it yet. It's like, dude, I, left my six, multiple six figure job and I'm doing things for free right now. I was like, I don't really have $60,000 just to go you know, spend on coaching. And so unless I had to move assets around, sell cars and do that kind of get creative. And I was like, it's like, man, I, I really got to the point where I wanted to do it. And I was like, I just can't make that financial decision right now. It just doesn't make sense. So then they opened up the RT accelerator, which most people, you know, are in, there's like a thousand people in that. So that's around, I think back then it was 300 a month is what that was costing. So I did that for a year. Mm -hmm. And after I got to see the process and I got to see the, the, the year one syndicate people, how they were getting the perks and what was that all about and seeing their Instagrams and getting to know a little bit about them. It's like, okay, that looks like a pretty cool thing. So year two is when I signed up for the syndicate and it actually went up. It was, I think it was $72,000 this the year. The devil, man, you give the devil you know, time. It's, it's going to keep going up because they only, they only let in a hundred people and they hand pick who yeah. they want to mentor because it's based on what impact you're creating, your character, your core values. I mean, they ask a lot of deep questions about things and what you've achieved. And so it's an honor to be selected by those guys because sure. they get 30,000 applications, dude. And they get it down to a hundred and they go, this is seriously. It. Yes. Shit. It's like college. Dude. And then even in the accelerator, they only limit it to something like 3000 initially. Wow. Like, do a cutoff well congratulations that must be i mean that's that's crazy numbers just to be accepted into something like that it is so that's <laughs> you know we're coming to the year end of it i think may is the graduation ceremony hopefully we'll be able to do it in person but right now we're looking at like it's going to be virtual because of yeah sure stuff. sure so it's 
It's been interesting. And I definitely think that the network of people is what I've noticed the, the most difference because it's not like we got Ed and Andy on tech stream speed dial, you know, like they're the leaders of this, but we, we tend to get more benefit from the members and helping each other out. Like there's, there's with a hundred people that are basically are multimillionaires and they're like, they know people and they can make things happen and yeah. they have connections. If you ask, like everybody's willing to help. Right. I need this. Do you know anybody that's like, yes, boom, you get three responses. Hey, call this person. Yeah. So it's, this is what it's all about. Like you hear this thing, another cliche phrase is all who you know. And I used to resist that. Not true. I used to resist it, but no, it is true. Well, they're missing the other part. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. not about what you know, it's about who you know, but when, who you get in the room, you better know. That's right. That's right. And the better way of saying that's it, it's about who knows you. That's right. Even better. Yeah. Cause like, you know them, but they don't know you. They don't matter. So if they yeah. know you, that's, that's, <laughs> that's so true. So it's, that's <laughs> about, dude. And you have, and it's, it's a very tight bonded group. I know that several of those people in there will be lifelong friends because mm -hmm. of the things we've kind of gone through. But even if I was an RT or not an RT, like those people are still going to be around because of the bonds that we created and the things we've done together. But it's, Dude, it's, you gotta, you gotta surround yourself with people to level up. And, and here's one good perception I'll, I'll share because I, mm -hmm. I've got some people that are around here in the Houston area and people in the car scene, the exotic car owners, you know, guys that are making, you know, high six figures, low seven figures a year, you know, successful by all, all measurable standards, but the quality of people inside the syndicate by far exceeds them because here's the thing, everybody in the syndicate knows they're successful but they don't have to big dick each other and one up each other. Sure. So it's very refreshing to go in there and, and I feel like, and honestly, I'm like one of the broke people in there and it sounds funny, but I am like, like people in there with eight, nine figure businesses, like killing it, making millions and millions of your profit. So it's a, it's a wide variety of people in there. They did that on purpose. But the thing is, it's like, I go hang around some people like I used to hang around, like in the car scene that would act like they're rich, act like with their baller and like, it was like all this fakery and it never sat well with me. And I used to think like, is this how it really is? Like, is this how everybody is that gets a little hint of money? Is this how they act? And no, it's not. It's just, I didn't know where to hang out, where those people were hanging out. The good ones were, you know? So you go join a group like that and you go, wow, this is a lot different. Like I was expecting. So you raised your vibrations like crazy there. I was expecting to go in there and everybody be throwing ego and like big dick in each other. And Hey guys, I bought three Ferraris last week and look at my yacht. And Hey, I flew in on the helicopter and hung out with a rod. I mean, that's what you think until you get in there. And then you realize like, no, these people actually are just legit and they don't have anything to prove anymore. That's which was your main thing. Yeah. You always felt like you had something to prove. And yeah. now the fact that you don't feel like you, I don't need to prove anything to fucking anybody. I don't, I don't, I really don't. I mean, people are always asking me, Tony, when are you going to buy a Lambo? You know, because, because they think that you have to go step into that perception. It's like, well, first of all, I like American cars. Yeah. So I would probably buy a hundred muscle cars and Dodge Vipers and Corvettes and Camaros before I got around to buying those. I, I mean, I got the money to go buy it. It's like, that's just not, I don't buy things for other people. Yeah. And I think, I think some people think that you have to do that. It's like, no, not do it for me. You know, you know, it's like I buy it for me, and I don't. And, and I drive my cars. I don't like just buy them and then go. Oh, I have that. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's a liability. That's not an asset. Yeah, just drive it, enjoy it. Like, why are you saving it for the next guy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's exactly right. <clears throat> um, final little thing I want to talk about you and Lisa being a power couple, mm -hmm. and uh, how you guys came across some of the goals that you have now. And some of the goals that you're currently talking about trying to even step up your game and your vibration needs them even, even more than you are uh, that you're at right now. Well, we've been together since we got married in 2005 and we we're together two years before that. So it's coming up on 17 years and it's all been just a communication. I'll tell you when we met, it was, a, it was more of a, we had a lot in common, you know, kind of similar upbringings, military dad, you know, lower middle class, uh, highly educated, like for, for public school standards and just had a lot in common, like drive and ambition and things like that. And it was, it was always about a communication thing. We actually met dancing. 
you know, most people don't realize like we Yes, were, I, yeah, I do I remember that at, story. Uh, Western ballroom dancing, like learning how to do the two-step polka and the waltz, you know, I, that's where we met. And we started dating about a year later, you know, so it was kind of funny how that all happens. Cause you know, me and my, one of my best friends at the time, like we joined there just so we can learn some dance moves so we can go pick up chicks at the country bar and never thought you'd meet your wife like at the dance class and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it all fun. It kind of, it's funny how it all works out, right? Sure. Oh yeah, that's true. But it's, uh, I, there was tough times in our marriage. It was never like always perfect, obviously, because there was a lot of times I was gone. I used to work offshore. Sometimes I'd be gone a month, six weeks at a time. And, you know, it was, that was kind of tough on our early part of our marriage. And then when we started working for home, we also had to readjust as well because we both left oil careers and both work at home. I mean, she's in a bedroom next door, like in the office. So, you know, she's decided to launch her real estate business at the time I was launching my coaching business. So here we have two startups going on with no like W2 jobs at all coming in. Mm. And we had to relearn how to work together. We used to share an office, but that doesn't, there's a lot of conflict there too, because it's just noise and distraction. So now it's been three years working at home and we've adapted and we just go to the gym together. We go to the grocery store, we go walk in the neighborhood. And so we make time, we watch TV show it in the evenings and stuff like that. So we have time to hang out, but during the day, for the most part, we don't like really interact. It's just like she's in her office doing my thing. I'm in my office doing my thing, kind of like at work, right? But it, that's how you become productive, right? So other than that, it's a, uh, I don't, I mean, I've always been the bigger dreamer. I'm a visionary type thing. And she's, she's very dedicated and supportive. And, and she's starting to think a little bit more like that. But it's, I've always gravitated towards it. I, I think it's because my mom. My mom was a, the dreamer. I mean, Japanese immigrant came here, really liked the United States. She liked that her two kids would have the opportunity to do anything in their life and live the American dream. And she used to say things like that to me. She's like, Tony, you can be anything you want. She's like, you can be boss of a company. You can be the president of the United States. You can be astronaut because we grew up around NASA. So we were kind of in the space scene. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, you can be anything you want. You can be a pilot, race car. So she was always like, encouraging me and no dream was too too big have so. you have you ever noticed that the people who get are like become discouraged or discourage other people weakens their vibrations and, and doesn't really help compared to supporting other people and trying to lift them up and say that you can do anything and you can be anything you want to be yeah yeah i think i think it's also for um people maybe surrounding themselves or being raised by people who didn't believe in them. And they kind of just transfer that energy to everybody else because you program their subconscious thoughts were programmed that I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And they just adopt that for themselves and that becomes their identity. So like victim becomes perpetrator type thing. Yeah. Mm. I just think that some people don't believe in themselves. I, I, it is hard. I've always been a daredevil type though, Mark. I, I adrenaline junkie and I'm, I'm used to jumping the bike ramp with extra bricks underneath it and jumping over garbage cans and riding skateboards off of roofs and doing mm -hmm. crazy shit. And I probably should have died a hundred times. Bang. I probably would have been a lot smarter if I didn't bang my head so many times, but <laughs> with that in mind, I've never been, you're still good looking though. So that's good. I've never, I've never been afraid of suiting up and just running to go play football and go and do and just, you know, getting in fights. I just never was afraid of that stuff. I, I like, I'm still addicted to the fear and the adrenaline rush of things. So that kind of plays into my entrepreneurial spirit as well, because I'm willing to take risks. I don't just blindly take risks. I take calculated risks. That's what <laughs> entrepreneurs do, but I'm not. This afraid. is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that's it. You have to just be able to do it. Most people are not willing to pull the trigger and go do it. That's the problem. And I've always been like, I'll go do it. Well, let me think about how to do it. Okay, I'm going to go do it. Like, I'll just go do it. Tony, I appreciate you. This has been a very, very helpful thing, not only for me, but I know people who listen to this will learn so much, truly, not only about themselves and not only about you, not only about me, but just in general, learning. Yeah, man, it's been fun chatting with you as always. Where can people find you? Where can people follow you? And how can they sign up to be coached by you? 
Website is 365driven.com. That's the easiest way to find me. And from that website, you'll find all my social media, book, group, everything's in one website. Easy. 365driven.com. Cool. Tony, my man, I appreciate you. Um, if there's anything I can do for you, please reach out. Don't ever hesitate. Awesome, Mark. Well, thank you, man. We'll see you later. Sounds good. Thanks, buddy. Good morning.